There was this one show I would watch as a kid where I swear no one else remembered it but me. The show is called Super Noobs. Yes, it's a silly sounding show name and it does live up to it. It's definitely aged to be cringe and lacks substance as a cartoon and a piece of media in general. However, for some reason, the show had some charm to me and if you don't put a critical lens to it, it's pretty fun. This show is definitely an example of something that is bad on a fairly critical level, but nostalgic. Super Noobs is a kid's cartoon that was created by Scott Fellows, known for creating Johnny Test. This checks out as it is the same type of humor and style as Johnny Test. It aired from 2015 to 2019. This was genuinely a surprise for me as I thought it was much older than I remembered and 2019 was a lot more recent than I expected. It's about these four middle school kids who suddenly gain the responsibility to fight alien viruses that infect Earth. They have this piece of special equipment called battle balls that transform into various pieces of technology at will, and its most known purpose, giving them superpowers. We have the most seeming protagonist, Tyler Bowman, a blonde kid who kind of acts as the leader of the four and tries to be the most moral and responsible. He has the ability to teleport and read minds. Then there's Kevin Reynolds, who serves as a sort of contrast to Tyler. He's a lot more brash and irrational. He has the ability to shapeshift into animals, basically like Beast Boy. Then we have Jennifer Shope, who is known as Shope. She serves as the brains of the group and the group's only girl. She has the ability to control Earth's natural forces such as wind, water, electricity, etc., you name it. This is extremely overpowered, but we'll get into that later. Last but not least, there's Theodore Roachmont, known as Roach. He's a comedic relief and the most innocent kid out of the four. He has the ability to fly and have super strength by enlarging his fists. They get these powers and battle balls from these two alien recruiters, Memnock and Zenblock, also known as Mem and Zen. From the pilot, it's clear that they have a lack of understanding of Earth and give these battle balls to these four out of mistake, thinking they were Earth warriors when in reality they were just mundane middle schoolers playing paintball. It's quite a comedic premise, but it's also such a cool concept on paper. Preteens who become superheroes recruited by aliens to fight invasive and destructive viruses. However, it's executed with reliance on exaggerated humor and comes off as a ridiculous cartoon with a lack of substantial plot. I think of other shows within this genre that were taken more seriously and had more acclaim such as Ben 10 and Lego Ninjago. There were definitely humor in these shows, but there was a lot more plot and more compelling storylines. Overall, its reception was fairly decent with its premiere debuting with a whopping 818,000 viewers. However, it was not the most well-received from critics. For example, from Jacqueline Applegate from Comic Book Resources says, The animation is decent enough to give the show at least one quick watch. Consequently, that's just about the only decent part of the show. The characters are unlikable, the voice acting is downright embarrassing, and the storylines are so ridiculous you will feel as though you're losing brain cells watching a single episode. Quite harsh. I can see these points, but I don't think I would produce that negative of a response. My criticism of the show comes out of a modern lens toward it, and out of love and nostalgia for it. There are definitely some negative parts of the show, no doubt, but I think this show had potential and deserved a bit more recognition for what it is, trying to combine cheesy comedy within the superhero kids genre. The superpowered kids trope is a pretty common format of media for children then, especially in the 90s to the 2010s, especially with shows like Power Rangers, Animorphs, Winx Club, Sailor Moon, you name it. It's a pretty prevalent premise in cartoons and anime and gives a sense of imagination to children. The audience can see themselves in these characters who live with a duality in their identity. From being a normal kid to saving lives with superhuman abilities. It's an entertaining trope in media and you often see these powers displayed in action, but also see the protagonists struggle on how they balance these identities. The tension and lies also build up with how no one knows who the hero is. Super Noobs definitely plays within this trope, but it also feels unconventional, as we barely see the characters' personal relationships outside of their friend group and Mem and Zen. The human characters serve as useless gags to move the plot forward. They are flat and exaggerated. I mean, come on, I can't make this up. The jock bully is named Jock Jockerson. There's no way an 8th grader is built like that. And the kids are in 7th grade. I think Super Noobs could have played into this trope better. The main characters live in a world that seems to lack consequence. They take injuries like it's nothing, they fall from great distances, survive blasts, and their scratches serve as comedy with cast and raggedness, just as a typical cartoon would. And the humans, I'm just going to call them NPCs, 
They just feel programmed and do not take up dimensional space. In these other shows, there's social consequences to their secrets and their dual identities. People suspect where they go and what they are doing. This does not show up much. However, it does tackle responsibility, with an episode of them experiencing burnout and wanting to take a break. So, they turn their battle balls into toys that they personally desire, and it later shows the consequences of this. I know I can't rely on re applying real-life logic to cartoons, but there are some points where it gets absolutely ridiculous. Hell, the property damage alone and the world going back to normal in the next episode is countless. I know other cartoons that are guilty of this. I just question how this town, Cornberry, where it seems like a modest town, survives so much damage like it's nothing. I know this will look like a ridiculous example to bring up, but Invincible is so good and takes on the superhero teenage trope so well, showing the dark reality and consequences of being a hero and taking on a dual identity. Obviously, I don't expect this show to be an Invincible, this is a kid's show, but possibly showing more depth of the NPCs and making the individual storylines of characters more compelling would be a lot better. Hell, I think the individual characters fill as the sort of role and mold within each episode that can get repetitive. Tyler trying to be the voice of reason, Kevin doing some irresponsible thing that's a catalyst of the conflict, Sho being the epitome of the nerd emoji, and Roach acting as the comic relief sidekick. In a way, I can appreciate Sho being known as the nerdy smart character rather than the girl. There are some shows out there where they just treat the sole girl as its gender, and to serve as a love interest to the protagonist where that's just blatant sexism. I'd rather have an exaggerated flat character than the girl trope. And from seeing the show so far, they just seem like a genuine friend group. Though there have been some hints of Kevin liking Shope, I believe it did not end canon. However, it is difficult to write a bunch of individual storylines within a squad as the main characters. A lot of superhero squads are written as a mold for the episode. However, other shows tend to tackle individuals and squads a lot better. For example, Lego Ninjago has character arcs and dedicated seasons for each ninja. I'm not asking for each character to get their own season, but it was a form of tackling individual character arcs in a squad setting. There's also the antagonist, Venomous. He does not appear often, and his motives are very unclear and shallow. Typical kids cartoon villains just do what they do out of evil, with no clear reason. Anyways. I mainly forget he's in the show, as his appearances are occasional and he's hard to take seriously. Enough about negativity towards the superhero kids show trope, and how the other cartoons play into it better, I'll bring up some positives. First, the character designs are pretty cool. Their hero forms play into a sci-fi role and look techy and futuristic, which is something I eat up every time. I just love science fiction and how they look like super soldiers with their glasses and suits. The colored hair is also a fun idea to accentuate their colors and add on to the secret identity, as it's difficult to change hair color on a limb. Guys, they have blue hair and pronouns. They're about to defeat the fascist virus. No way. Well, props to them on the hero designs. They're fire. Even their default designs are simple and nice to the eye. They look and act like middle schoolers, and it feels like an accurate setting. Their color schemes are nice and pleasing, and I enjoy how minimal it looks. Besides Shove, their dress wear is different to their battle ball colors, which is nice. I remembered shows like Power Rangers where their daily wear was the color scheme of their color to make it obvious to the audience which color they were. Even some small details like Kevin having braces, it fits his personality of being a bold and brash sounding kid, when in reality he just looks like someone you can't take seriously. Also, with Tyler wearing a shirt over long sleeves with jorts and that long hair, it just looks like a middle school cut in a zeitgeist of a 2010s fit. Peak fashion over there. With Sho being the tallest, it's also on point because in middle school, girls are usually taller, so it's such a funny yet accurate detail. The contrast between them makes up a nice cast. Another positive is just the overall display of their powers. Seeing a variety of powers amongst them and them working together in tandem is always satisfying to watch. However, not seeing the full potential of each of their powers is a bit disappointing as their skill ceilings seem so high, especially Shopes. On to the next segment, the details of their powers. Now on to their powers in detail. To be honest, this will be a rant on Shope because controlling Earth's natural resources is OP and her powers were so underutilized. I'm going to be ranking the four from least to most powerful based on skill ceiling and if these powers were utilized to their fullest potential. First, we have Roach. With the ability to fly and have super strength, the power comes off as typical and uninteresting, as several superheroes in media have these abilities as a standard rather than a sole power. However, he is seen as extremely useful as in the episode The Newbie Booby Booby, excuse the inappropriate sounding name. 
He was taken advantage of by his friends to be the only one to defeat the virus as his approach to stopping the virus is pretty straightforward, flying towards them and watching his oversized fists at them. It's a simple but effective approach. This episode was sort of sad as Roach realizes he's being used and notices the others not helping him in which they gaslight him saying they're helping. I feel perhaps you guys are taking advantage of me and my super strength too much lately. What? You're crazy. Why would you say such a thing? The ending of the episode results in the squad learning their lesson to work together and not be reliant on one person. While his powers are the easiest to defeat the virus with, the full potential ceiling is the lowest among all of them. Next, I have Tyler. Tyler's power has a lot of potential in a tactical setting. The ability to teleport near the enemy and to read their mind, to know their plans and intentions is extremely useful. Getting that intel and knowledge in order to counter them is such a vital and reliant way to defeat the enemy. However, for defeating a virus, viruses don't have much of a mind in the first place. He would have to learn physical combat to fully get the use of teleportation in order to gain an advantage in fights. Otherwise, teleporting around the enemy just serves as a distraction. For second, I have Kevin. And I was debating between where to put second and third for Tyler and Kevin as they're ranked pretty close and I see them around the same level. It is debatable on whether shapeshifting or mind reading slash teleportation is more powerful and useful. With the ability to shapeshift, it's definitely useful for sure. What makes him above Roach is that he could just turn into an animal that can fly or have super strength. He could be a lot more versatile with his powers. He could also make specific limbs animal-like and not morph his entire form. He could also combine multiple animals and shapeshift into hybrid animals. Freaky to imagine, but the limits with animals seem endless. There was also an episode where he could shapeshift into humans but needed a link from Zen to do so. Overall, Kevin's ability is extremely variable and leaves a lot of room for creativity to fight a virus. And the most powerful where I already spoiled it is no doubt Shope. Seriously, controlling the Earth's elements and natural resources? That's ridiculous. Usually powers have controlling one element, whether that be water, lightning, wind, but she can control them all. She is literally the avatar. She mainly uses her powers to control the weather. What's impressive is that she can control the size and target of the weather. Being able to summon lightning, wind, rain, tornadoes is just insane. She can also control magnetism, water, and electricity as well. Due to the first episode where her battle ball was pressed, everything magnetic drew to her. In the episode, How to Noob the Science Fair. She made a freaking particle accelerator as her science fair project. When I said she's a nerd, she is a nerd. She casually mentions that she used her powers to obtain uranium for her particle accelerator. Are you kidding me? She can obtain uranium with her powers? How did the judges not call NASA or the government for this? She is a 12 year old who made a particle accelerator and she obtained uranium. I just can't get over the underutilization of her powers, and this proves my point of the lack of social consequences from their powers. Shope receives no recognition for her particle accelerator, and every time the virus comes up, the bystanders never question the cause of them. Shope's full potential sounds godlike, literally being able to control the earth. How she's not on a list questions me every time I watch this show. I know I've mentioned other cartoons and shows already, but I want to go into more detail on how this compares to other shows. I'm going to start it off by saying this. I don't know if this is a hot take, but I would rather watch Super Noobs over Miraculous Ladybug. I said it. How this video just turned into me slandering Miraculous Ladybug, I don't know, but I'll take it. While Miraculous Ladybug tries to have a consecutive plot, the experience watching it gave me a lot of secondhand embarrassment and made me cringe. Super Noobs definitely has some cringy jokes and moments, no doubt, but the show intends to be humorous and ridiculous. In a way, that makes Super Noobs a bit more self-aware. Marinette's overbearing crush towards Adrian is overwhelming to the show and just comes off as stalkery. Her clumsiness is seen as more ridiculous than endearing. Overall, she's just an unlikable protagonist. While Super Noobs has a crush plot with Tyler liking this girl in his grade, Amy Anderson, it's pretty light to the show and can be easily ignored. However, as they're both shows within the super-powered kids genre, I think this comparison is somewhat fair. They both have accessories that allow them to transform into their superhero forms. I'm not going into too much detail about these other shows as this video is about super noobs, but these are some reminders and comparisons I get from watching this show. Now, this is a very far-fetched comparison, but I thought of H2O just add water. This show emphasizes keeping their mermaid identities a secret, and they literally cannot touch water or they would transform. 
They also had powers, but it was more secondary to their identities, as being a mermaid was first. They displayed a lot of social consequences, keeping their identity a secret, as they were questioned why they couldn't get near water. Super noobs, on the other hand, must enforce their superhero identities as a secret. However, there seems to be a lack of social consequence hiding it. As Shope says, Nobody can know about this. If they do, the military will find us, slap us on an examination table, and dissect us like a frog in biology class. However, they don't do a lot of measures to hide their identities. The NPCs are oblivious. Sure, there are questions about their whereabouts, but it's not overbearing and negative to their actions. I know I'm repeating this comparison again, but I'm bringing up Lego Ninjago. I'm going to compare how the female characters are written, Shope and Nia. When Nia was written in the older seasons, it was flawed. She was known as Kai's sister and wasn't adventuring along with the other ninjas. She sort of served as the girl trope, but later they became self-aware of it in the later seasons where she proves herself as an individual character rather than just a girl. There was this later arc where it was revealed that she had water elemental powers, but it just felt like a sudden plot device. However, with Shope, it's clear she's among the group and an equal. She serves as a superhero in the team, fights among the others, and is a good friend within the group. It's nice and refreshing that the main cast is egalitarian and co-ed. And in my previous point, it's obvious she has the most powerful abilities. She's not perceived as weak and is overall a strong asset to the team. I know these comparisons are random, but bringing up these other shows within this trope makes me analyze certain elements of it and its strengths and weaknesses from one to another. Would I recommend this show to watch? If you can turn your brain off and appreciate the concept, character design, and animation, yes. Obviously, don't think too deeply about the show. It's not like it provides a ton of moral and ethical dilemmas and gives depthful lessons. There's going to be fart jokes and immature humor. That's the nature of the show. I feel like internally, I can't shamelessly like this show. It's embarrassing to admit that I like this. It's a guilty pleasure for me, honestly. My critiques feel like I'm trying to justify why I like this show. While I stand by my points, internally I think I can give it a little slack for what it is. Silly superhero kids cartoon. Right now I'm rewatching half of season 1, but plan to finish the show. And you question, why am I yapping about this show when I haven't even finished it? Good question. I just think I'm passionate about why this show feels so forgotten and that there's almost no content on it. As I am making this video, if you search up Super Noobs on YouTube, there's only episodes of it, no fan content or any external content about it whatsoever. It's nice that all of these episodes are on YouTube. However, they're only in 360p, but it kind of adds to the experience. I'm just glad it's not lost media and I'm not seen as crazy. If I were to change this show, I think I would definitely explore the concept in a more depthful way and put a more serious tone to it. Having middle school main characters seems like a good age group, but it seems like its audience is younger than their demographic. I'd want to add a more social aspect to the characters' lives, write the bullies to have a more subtle feel to them. It's overplayed and unrealistic of bullies shoving their victims into lockers and flexing their muscles. Also, it just adds a more coming-of-age aspect to it. They're middle schoolers, they're supposed to be growing and changing. Obviously, it won't be like Big Mouth, but showing some realistic parts of middle school is raw and relatable supposed to be awkward and uncomfortable. I'd also want to see more students outside of the group and how they would interact with them. Maybe they'd get the chance to socialize outside their friend group and develop as a character if they're willing to sacrifice their friend group in order to take social opportunities, which is a realistic conflict. The superhero aspect is cool, no doubt, but I would probably tweak the powers to be more balanced, as in buffing Roach and nerfing Shope, or at least show Shope's full potential. By showing some character development of how these characters gain their powers and control them, the opportunity to be more responsible with them and gain better teamwork is always a good theme, and also the individual characters growing out of their mold and becoming more dimensional. I feel like an interesting spin with kids not knowing each other beforehand and all having individual storylines. Then, they share the common event of getting their battle ball and have to work through the circumstances. Coming from different backgrounds and perspectives has such a potential in having to work together. I love the style of that type of group. Maybe Tyler's just your average protagonist who lives a normal life, Kevin being the troubled and juvenile one, Shope coming from an elite academic performance and how she has to struggle with balancing school and being a superhero, and Roach being a sheltered, naive kid not knowing a lot of things in life. These are just vague examples, but it can be a breakfast club situation. I'd also want to see a more compelling antagonist to the show. 
Maybe it's a conspiracy where the galactic government was behind the virus the entire time, and their intention was to train warriors for greater future threats. While it is a good intention, the execution of using uncontrollable viruses and relying on warriors to defeat them can be dangerous. See how easy it was to come up with a motive? The villain is just so forgettable and does what he does for evil. It's supposed to be comedic, but just falls off as flat. With this antagonist and motive, I'd want to see the themes of what they're actually fighting for in comparison on Earth versus the galaxy in authority. Is what they believe in all a lie? These questions and themes can go deep and be insightful to the viewer. Another factor I'd want to add is to show risk, stakes, and injury. These guys can tank several types of attacks like it's nothing. If it doesn't show an individual not only fighting physically, but also fighting mentally as they go through the pain of these virus attacks, it shows the dark reality of being a superhero, how there's a price to saving lives and using your powers responsibly. I think the action fighting scenes could also be longer and more apparent. Surprisingly enough, the action scenes in the show are pretty lacking in proportion to the overall episode. I know these changes give it a more dark and realistic tone towards the show, contrasting to its original light-hearted and comedic feel to it. I definitely still have some humor towards it, but it seems I'd want to focus on the conflicts of living the duality of being a superhero and having more coming-of-age themes that come within middle school. Super Nudes deserves a bit more recognition, to be honest. Out of the two main shows Scott Fellows created, I personally find Super Noobs better and Johnny Tess seemed to overshadow it. The fact that there's no YouTube content outside of episodes is quite sad. Its legacy is just some 360p episodes that are free to watch. Don't get me wrong, I'm glad I can watch this show free as it's not on streaming services, but it deserves some outsider content. Though there are definitely some flaws to this show, it's pretty nostalgic and fun. <laughs>